Chapter 1. The Human Being in the Environment The first and fundamental task of a professional who has decided to devote himself or herself to the study and practice of a true therapeutic science is above all else to re-establish health in a diseased individual. <clears throat> It is therefore crucial for such a professional to first ask the following questions. What is a human being? How is the human being constructed? How does the human being function in the context of the universe? What are the laws and principles governing the function of the human being in both health and disease? It is only through understanding the answers to these questions that the practitioner can bring about cure in the individual, thereby restoring the patient to harmony with himself and the universe surrounding him. Moreover, understanding his answers is necessary in order to be able to recognize and appreciate a true cure as it is emerging in the patient. To begin with, we must recognize that the human organism is not an isolated entity sufficient unto itself. Every individual is born, lives, and dies inseparably from the larger context of physical, social, political, and spiritual influences. The laws governing the physical universe are not separate from those governing the functions of the living organisms. So, we must begin by comprehending clearly the setting in which the human being is found, how it influences him, and in turn, how he affects it. As with all things, the human organism was originally designed to function harmoniously and compatibly in the environment. The intention of this design, obviously, was to establish a dynamic balance in which both the individual and the environment are mutually benefited. Any imbalance inevitably leads to destruction, which diminishes both the human being and the universe in which he or she lives. Since human beings are endowed with consciousness and awareness, they carry a great responsibility, both for their own benefit and for that of the cosmos, to live according to the laws of nature. Ideally, the human race should have enough consciousness and awareness to live within and contribute to the order of the universe, and thereby be free to achieve the highest possibilities of evolution. Instead, we find ourselves in the midst of disorder and disease. In the midst of an age of unprecedented technological advancement, we also see unprecedented damage being done to the atmosphere, the water, and the land. Socially, it is easy to pessimistically conjecture that the modern epidemics of competition, violence, and war may well lead to the actual destruction of the human race. And individually, instead of rejoicing in an increasing degree of vibrant health from generation to generation, we witness a continuous decline in health. So why is this so? In the most basic analysis, we can ascribe this state of degeneration to two dynamics. <clears throat> One, human violations of laws of nature resulting in contamination of the environment in which in turn places increased stress on the ability of the individual to function. Two, mankind has gradually lost the inner awareness which would have enabled correct perception of the laws of nature which must be respected. Thus we see that both collectively and individually human beings are simultaneously affecting and are affected by the environment. As we deviate increasingly from the laws of nature, a vicious cycle is established which requires great insight and energy to correct. For each individual in this situation, there may be a wide variety of possible responses to external stresses. Some people seem to be relatively unaffected by external or internal disturbances, their organisms are in a state of relative balance, which is maintained with minimal effort. Most people, on the other hand, experience degrees of imbalance ranging from slight to very severe. These are individuals we consider diseased or diseased in the broadest use of the term. 
In such people, the disturbance manifests itself in a highly individualistic and varied manner, but always the disturbance can be viewed as an imbalance in the organism's ability to cope with internal and external influences. If we consider the individual as a totality, it is clear that the disturbances do not manifest themselves solely on the physical level of existence as assumed in modern allopathic medical practice. The entire person is disturbed on all levels of existence to varying degrees. It is a common observation made by everyone that people vary in their sensitivity to environmental influences. Some people throughout life are blessed with the capacity to maintain a high level of creative living despite minimal hours of sleep, erratic diet, heavy work responsibilities, family pressures, and perhaps even major griefs in life. Other people, on the other hand, feel overwhelmed by minimal stresses, must get many hours of sleep and whelmed by and rest every day and suffer a variety of symptoms after even a slight deviation from their usual diet. Some people barely notice heat and cold, while others are, are so sensitive that they can predict weather changes a day in advance. Why is it that some people can cope with stresses effortlessly and others become disturbed very easily? This is a very basic question which has separated two major traditions of medical thinking throughout Western history. On the one hand, the rationalist tradition which led to modern orthodox medical thinking focuses on what concrete factors lead to sickness in a person in the hope that somehow understanding the exciting cause of illness will enable curative intervention. This approach has been tested and applied quite adequately, adu adequately through history, yet we still see a steady and alarming increase of crippling degenerative diseases. On the other hand, the empiric tradition of thought focuses on the question, what enables a person to remain healthy despite many nauseous influences? Consideration of this question leads quickly to recognition of the fact that every organism possesses a defense mechanism <clears throat> which is constantly coping with stimuli from both internal and external sources. This defense mechanism is responsible for maintaining a state of homeostasis, which is a state of equilibrium between processes tending to disorder the organism and processes which tend to maintain order. Understanding precisely how this defense mechanism works is vital for any significant impairment of its function rapidly leads to imbalance and finally death. It is the action of the defense mechanism with which we will be dealing with throughout this book. So in this chapter we will content ourselves with just a brief overview. All environmental influences produce stimuli of a particular type. These stimuli are perceived by the organism by receptors on the mental, emotional, and physical levels of existence. The core of human existence depends on the ability of the organism to keep its dynamic equilibrium with a minimum of disturbance and in maximum constancy. The defense mechanism is constantly trying to create and maintain this balance, but it is not always completely successful. If the defense mechanism were always functioning perfectly, there would never be any suffering symptoms or disease. <clears throat> this mechanism in most people, however, does not function perfectly, for reasons which will be discussed extensively in later chapters. If the stimuli are stronger than the organism's natural resistance, a state of imbalance is created, which then manifests itself as signs and symptoms. Although the effects are experienced by the entire person on all levels, the manifestations are expressed with relatively greater force on either mental, emotional, or physical levels, depending upon the individual predisposition of the person. These symptoms or groups of symptoms are erroneously called diseases when in reality they represent the result of the struggle of the defense mechanism to counteract the more the morbific stimulus. B 
Before proceeding to more extensive descriptions of, the precise, of precisely how the defense mechanism works, let us first consider briefly the nature of the environmental influences with which the defense mechanism must cope, and some examples of the varied types of responses which can be observed in given individuals. Each of the levels of the environmental influences has a unique contribution which needs to be understood by the practitioner. Number one, the universe as a whole and its laws. Number two, the solar system. Number three, the nation. Number four, the immediate society. Five, the geographical location. Six, the family. The influence of the universe beyond the solar system is thus far little understood, but considering recent research being conducted on X-rays, cosmic rays, and electromagnetic fields on not only solar but also galactic levels, we can be confident that their effects will one day be considered important. Increasingly, it is becoming clear both to physicists and metaphysicists that the universe is one interesting whole, each component of which affects the others. The effects of the solar system are profound and well known. Of the greatest importance is the sun itself. <clears throat> Sunspots affect weather, the electromagnetic field of the Earth, and the ionization of the atmosphere, all of which in turn influence the health of people. The moon, of course, has long been known to have major influences on health. The, synchronous, the synchronicity between the menstrual cycle and moon phases has been repeatedly verified. In addition, history has long recorded the effects of moon phases on epileptics and psychotics. It is also an interesting fact that police and emergency crews of many major cities are now strengthened around the time of full moon because of the well-documented increase of violence and, and accidents during that phase. The nation also can affect people in a more biffic way. Every nation has a kind of mood within which the individual is caught. Americans, for instance, are in general too materialistically ambitious, desiring to accomplish and acquire far more than is needed in order to be happy. This constant pressure will eventually undermine their nervous systems so that by the age of 55 or 60, they may require institutionalization in a rest home. Other countries as well have national characteristics or have national characters which are topics of conversation the world over. The mood of the nation can play a significant role in shaping the expression of illness of the individual. One's work environment and pressures produce obvious influences which are being studied by the medical profession in great detail. Exposures to nauseous substances such as asbestos, lead, silica, dust, and radioactive products are well known. Noise levels, the pressures of deadlines, the effects of repetitive tasks, and even executive responsibilities are known occupational hazards, <clears throat> which can produce crippling illnesses. Even inadequacies in education, as we shall see in more detail in a later chapter, have profound influence on the emotional strength or weakness of people. By geographical conditions, I refer not only to climatic conditions, but also to the ecology of the area, particularly the degree of contamination of the atmosphere, water, and food supply. Sanitary conditions and altitude. These influences give us a good opportunity to consider in some detail precisely how an individual may be affected by external stimuli in a unique manner depending upon the degree of weakness existing in his or her defense mechanism. Let us examine, for example, what effects have, what effects a very humid, let us examine, for example, what effects a very humid climate can have on people with different levels of health. 
A quite healthy person system will resist humidity with minimal disturbance of the existing equilibrium and will recover without any significant sequelae. A person with a lesser degree of health may develop stiffness of muscles, pains in the joint, sinusitis, sinusitis, rhinitis, or asthma. The focus of disturbance in such a case is primarily on the physical body. Another person with an even worse state of health may develop an anxiety state or even depression in such a climate. The focus of disturbance here is on the emotional plane. Someone with very poor health may develop dullness of mind and an inability to concentrate. The focus in this instance is on the mental level. In each of these examples, the morbific stimulus, humidity, is received by receptors on the physical level of the organism. The effect is felt by the entire organism on all levels, but the resulting manifestation of imbalance or disturbance is expressed on one, on one level or another, depending on the predisposition disposing weakness of the individual. The influence of the family can also be an extremely powerful factor in the health of the individual. Again, let us demonstrate in some detail how the individuality of the person is combined with external circumstances to produce a variety of possible conditions. We will take as an example of a stress we will take as an example a stressful relationship between a mother and a daughter due to a subconscious competition or jealousy, considering only the effect on the daughter. In such a situation, the emotional tension can reach an incredible degree. Even unintentional words or actions of the mother can produce extreme pain to the daughter. If such a situation remains unresolved over a long time, the daughter's reaction may take one of the following forms. 1. If the daughter is quite healthy, she may eventually disregard and ignore the mother's influence. She understands the whole situation and the initial stress is easily released. The stimulus in this instance has not overcome the organism's natural resistance and thus has not created a state of imbalance. 2. If the daughter's organism is constitutionally not quite so healthy, there are they may there may well develop a disturbance manifesting as severe acne on the face or eczema or duodenal ulcer, etc. Here the stimulus is stronger than the defense mechanism and is received through the emotional receptors but manifests solely in the physical body. 3. If the, daughter's health has, ha, if the daughter's health has been further undermined, a more serious ailment may develop. In the beginning, it may be an excessive lack of confidence in social situations, later perhaps apathy, and finally a depression. In this instance, the stimulus is received through the emotional receptors and results in a disturbance manifesting primarily on the same level. 4. If the daughter's health were even further deteriorated due to hereditary predisposition, the same degree of stress overwhelms the resistance even more severely, and a mental disorder is produced. The child is unable to concentrate in school, eventually may lose marks in class, and may complain that she does not comprehend material which previously was understood perfectly well. Such a progression, if continued, may well end in psychosis. This instance demonstrates a stress received by emotional receptors and transmitted to the center of being the mental level. A crucial and profound conclusion that can be drawn from such examples is that the human being is a whole, integrated entity, not fragmented into independent parts. Medicine, in general, has amassed a great deal of information concerning human beings from anatomy.
physiology, pathology, psychology, psychiatry, biochemistry, molecular biology, biophysics, and so on. Unfortunately, each of these branches of study has examined the individual from its particular angle. No one denies that what was revealed through these laborious studies has been illuminating and often useful, but such studies have not so far given us a clear, integrated idea of what a human being is functioning in its totality, not merely on its molecular level, nor on the organ level, nor even on the psychological level alone. Consequently, modern therapeutics takes a fragmented view of the human being. If the liver is affected, give something for the liver. If the nose is running, give some medicine for the nose. The knowledge is half half hazard half hazard rather than being based on systematically verified laws and principles derived from observation of human beings. The above examples consider the effects of environmental stimuli on people of varying degrees of health, of ill health. The structure and function of the human being can similarly be described in the healthy state. If we observe a healthy man, we can easily discern that he is an integrated organism acting all the time, either consciously or unconsciously. Action is the characteristic of a living organism. Action can be either passive or active, and the exact nature of the action is an expression of the individuality of the person. The activity of an individual is manifested primarily on three levels the mental level, emotional level, and physical level. At any moment, the activity of a person is centered mainly on one of these three levels. So either mental, emotional, or physical. The center of activity may change frequently, even rapidly, depending on the intention of the circumstances of the person, but always there is a dynamic interaction among these three levels. When a person functions on one of these levels, the whole integrated system cooperates to fulfill its objective in the best possible way. A long-distance runner during the activity of running has mobilized fully all functions onto the physical level. The same is true when someone does manual labor. A man who tries to solve a difficult problem has his mental faculties mobilized, while his emotional Emotions and physical functions are kept quiet. A man who meets his beloved after a long separation allows a full play to his emotions while reducing the mental and physical activities. Of course, it is always the whole of the person that is acting, but, the, but his intention, his awareness, is centered upon the particular plane on which he has elected to function. This concept may seem simplistic and of little practical value, but we shall later see that it has the most profound significance in the process of producing and evaluating a cure of a disease. Summary of chapter one. The human being is an integrated whole acting all the time through three distinct levels, the mental, the emotional, the physical, the mental level being the most important and the physical the least. 2. The activity of the human organism may be passive or active. In disease, the reactions of the defense mechanism to various stimuli are of most concern to the practitioner. 3. The human being from the moment of birth lives in a dynamic environment which is affecting his organism at all times in many ways and is therefore obliged to adjust continuously in order to maintain a dynamic equilibrium. 4. If the stimuli are stronger than the organism's natural resistance, a state of imbalance will occur with signs and symptoms erroneously labeled disease. 5. The results of this struggle can be seen primarily upon the mental, emotional, or physical level, depending upon the overall state of health at the moment of the stress. End of chapter 1.